Looking again at verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. I don't know about you, but that's easier said than done for me. In our 24-hour news cycle, it's very hard to watch the news and not become just a little bit anxious. Uh, my degree's in economics, so I'm always kind of keyed into what's going on with the, the economy. And as I hear about rising inflation, I know the Federal Reserve has to raise interest rates in order to combat that inflation, which is not good for the stock market, which then leads to rumors of recession. And I can look at my own retirement account and see that it's dwindling, even though I keep feeding it. Do not be anxious about anything. Hard to do. It's hard to abide by those words, particularly in the time we're living in. We hear about the war in Ukraine, and many different commentators are wondering, what will Putin do next? Do not be anxious about anything. I don't know, but it seems like every month there's some type of tragedy, some type of unsolved homicide like what happened in Idaho that causes great anxiety for me. I'm just wondering, how could something like that happen? Or there's a mass shooting somewhere, and I wonder, how could that happen? And it makes me feel a little insecure. It makes me feel just a, a little bit anxious. I've got good news for you. Starting uh, Wednesday, January 18th, uh, Kim Talley and Murray Gossett are going to be leading a Wednesday night class on this back book by Max Lucado. It's called Anxious for Nothing. Uh, if you haven't got a copy of this, I would encourage you. We'll be selling them uh, at the class in the parlor, uh, 6.30 to 7.30, uh, January 18th. It's a great book that's focused on what Paul says to us in Philippians 4, 6 to 8, to be anxious for nothing. Do not be anxious about anything. But the fact is, these last few years, we've been living in anxious times, haven't we? I mean, with the global pandemic, there's all kinds of anxiety as millions and millions of people lost their lives, and governments throughout the world were doing the best they could, some with very strict shutdowns and others with maybe looser controls, and our own government did the best they could, shutting down the government at different times, causing anxious anxiety and frustration. Nobody really seemed to be satisfied with the decisions that were made, and it led to great division. It's continual anxiety, continual division can lead to depression. We feel like we're losing all hope. Things seem uncertain. What are we to do when we feel ourselves becoming depressed? Well, to see how God delivered Moses from his depression, I would encourage you to turn to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 29. It may be found on page 151 of that Red Pew Bible, Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 29. I would encourage you to take out that Red Pew Bible and keep it open as I make reference to the text throughout the message. But before I read God's Word, let's call upon His Spirit to guide us in the reading and preaching of His Holy Word. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we know that we live in uncertain times, but you are certain. You're certainly there for us when we turn to you. So, Lord, we turn to you this morning, seeking your wisdom, seeking your guidance and direction. We pray, O oh Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear, and open our hearts that we might be transformed at the reading and the preaching of your Holy Word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Numbers chapter 11, beginning with verse 4, listen to God's word. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of bdellium. The people went about and gathered it and ground it into hand mills or beat it into mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell with it. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. 
Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone. And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? But Moses said, The people among whom I am numbered six the people whom I am I am number six hundred thousand on foot. And you have said, I will give them meat that they may eat a whole month? Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them and be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them and be enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those who registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And as a young man, and a, and a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Here ends the reading of God's Word. As the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our Lord stands forever. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to look again at uh, our first verse there, verse 4, where we read, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. Now who are the, the rabble exactly? It's kind of a unique word, rabble. Everybody use rabble in your vocabulary very often, not me. It's kind of an SAT word, I guess. You know, it's interesting. This is actually the only time that this Hebrew word that's translated rabble is used in the entire Bible. It can be translated as rabble or riffraff or vagabonds. And because this is the only time that it's used, uh, and it's never used to describe the Israelites specifically, most scholars believe that this is a group of people, these vagabonds who were traveling with the Israelites, who got out of Egypt while the getting was good, right? They went with Moses and the Israelites, and they've been traveling with them for some time. But one thing that's true about this rabble, this riffraff, is that they're complaining constantly, constantly complaining that things aren't the way they used to be. I actually love the way that uh, Eugene Peterson, uh, in his wonderful English contemporary translation, The Message, translates uh, Numbers 11, verses 4 to 6. Listen to what he says here. The riffraff among the people had a craving, and soon they had the people of Israel whining. Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it free, to say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic. 
but nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna, manna. Manna. Manna's no good, right? Reminds me of, uh, it's the, from the old Brady Bunch where uh, she's saying, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. It's all about Marsha, right? It's all about manna, right? Manna, man, I'm so sick of seeing this manna, tasting this manna, eating this manna. But the fact is, this manna, this bread from heaven, it's keeping the people of Israel alive. And rather than being grateful, they're grumbling, grumbling about what they don't have. And as they grumble, the Israelites begin to grumble. They go, yeah, you're right. It would be nice to have some meat. Or what about those leeks or those onions or the garlic we used to have or the melons? Yeah, I miss that too. Have you ever noticed that when you spend time with negative people, you can become a little more negative? People start to complain about something and it just gets a little more negative and negative. I see this in politics all the time. I'll be having a conversation with someone, and someone will mention a particular politician or a particular political party or maybe some decision that's been made. And, you know, initially I go into the conversation kind of neutral, but then they start talking about how bad it is, and then someone chimes in how bad it is. And before you know, we're all saying how bad it is. We've just condemned the other side. Negativity breeds more negativity. This is true in social media. If you have a friend who posts something on your Facebook page, you know, maybe it's some kind of negative comment or something, and, and you think it's funny, you know, and so you like it, you give it a thumbs up, well, the algorithm of Facebook's going to keep sending you that type of information, right? Because they want to give you what you like, right? And so you find yourself in this group think of negativity. Yes, negativity breeds more negativity. This is how the gangrene of gossip spreads. Somebody says something, maybe it's a half-truth, they share what they know, but it's negative about someone. Rather than talking to the person directly, they talk about the person, and things start to get negative, and then someone wants to add their 10 cents and their 2 cents, and before you know it, you've got $100 worth of negativity. It's just no good, right? Negativity breeds negativity. How are we to resist gossip and negativity? Because Paul, the apostle, condemns gossip in Romans 1. It's a, it's a sin to gossip. We, we need to not be gossipers who speak negatively, negatively all the time. How can we avoid gossip and negativity? Well, I think we'll do what Paul instructs us to do in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, where we read, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If we'll focus our mind on what is good, we won't be drawn to the negative. You know, it's interesting, uh, several years ago, a friend of mine shared a TED Talk with me by a guy named Sean Acor. Sean Acor wrote a, a great book. It's called The Happiness Advantage. I think we can show you the cover of that book, The Happiness Advantage. Sean Acor is actually from Waco, Texas, He went to Harvard University, and then later he went to Harvard Divinity. And his TED Talk was so good, I just went out and bought the book. And what Sean Acor writes about is the fact, and the ironic fact, that when he was at Harvard, many of the people were very, well, they were very negative. In fact, they were were depressed. It it was odd, because you would think that everyone who got into Harvard would be happy, right? I mean, you're at Harvard, right? I mean, it's a great school. It's hard to get into Harvard, right? Not everybody can get into Harvard. I couldn't get into Harvard. How great it would be to, to be at Harvard, I would think. But the ironic thing is that most of the students at Harvard were the valedictorian or the salutatorian of their class. And when they were in high school, they were the who's who, and they were the top of their class. But now at Harvard, they're just average, and that's depressing for those students. But Sean, in his studies, found out that there were certain people who were successful, and the people who were the most successful for the long term were happy. And there were certain practices or certain habits that they had, that they did, that allowed them to remain happy for extended periods of time. One of those key habits was meditation. Spending time each and every day just to meditate, to do what Paul is instructing and encouraging us to do in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Spend time meditating. Now, Christian meditation is different than Eastern meditation. In Eastern religions, you're called to empty your mind. But in Christian meditation, you're actually called to fill your mind with the things of Christ. One of the great spiritual practices you can do is called centering prayer. In centering prayer, you you take a deep breath, 
And actually, uh, I read this thing about the Navy SEALs. They do something very similar uh, to help them calm down in anxious moments. It's called the box uh, breathing. You breathe in through your nose for four seconds. You hold it for four seconds, and then you breathe out for four seconds. And this slowing down of your breathing while meditating on what is good, what is honorable, what is commendable, what's just, what's worthy of praise, which would be Jesus, it helps calm us, helps us feel less anxious, and makes us more content in God. So as an application, let's try that this morning. We're going to breathe in for four seconds, and then hold it for four seconds, and then as you breathe out, just say the name of Jesus. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus. Let's do it again. Jesus. As we say the name of Jesus, we're reminded that Jesus' name means Yahweh saves, that our Lord is salvation, that God sent His Son Jesus to save us, to do for us what we can never do for ourselves, to live in perfect obedience to our Heavenly Father, and then die on a cross as the perfect atoning sacrifice for all of our sins so that we can know with full assurance that in Jesus Christ, we have the gift of eternal life as we turn to Him in faith and that all of our, our needs, our eternal needs, are met in Christ, that we don't have to worry because we know who holds the future. It's the Lord Jesus. As we give our life to Him, we will find peace. We will find contentment. Yes, Paul encourages and exhorts the church in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4, 4 to 6. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but on everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, how is it that Paul is able to rejoice in the Lord always? Do you know the story of the letter to the Philippians? He's writing it from prison. He doesn't know whether or not he's going to live or whether he's going to die. Yet he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He reemphasizes it. Be anxious in nothing but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I think that's the key. You know, when we pray, many of us, myself included, I just run to supplication. I just tell God what I need from Him. I, I kind of give Him my laundry list. But, but rather, Paul's encouraging us to, to pray with thanksgiving. One of the best acronyms I know to guide us in our prayer life is called ACTS, A-C-T-S. It stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And our order of worship is actually follows this. I began the service by adoring God. We've confessed our sins to God. We thank God for His forgiveness. And in a little while, Kim will lead us in a prayer of supplication where we make our requests known to God. But if we will begin by adoring God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, recognizing how good our God is, adoring Him, and then confessing our sins to God, unleashing that burden that holds us down with our sins, and then thanking God for His forgiveness, and then moving to supplication, what our needs might be, we will find greater peace. For example, let's say you want to pray for your children or maybe your grandchildren, you know, and you're, you're concerned about them. Rather than simply just praying for what you think they need or what you want for them, Begin by adoring God. As a parent, I, I adore God. I, I praise God for who God is. And then I confess, you know, God, I, I've been the best father I can be, but I know I haven't been perfect. And then I thank God for his forgiveness, and I thank God for these children that he's entrusted to me, these children who are created in his image. And, and as I think about who God is and what God's done, I know that our God loves my children more than I could ever love them, for he created each one of them in his image. And as you read in Psalm 139, the pages are written in God's book for each one of them before any one of those days came to be. That as you read in Jeremiah 29, 11, God has a, a plan for our children. It's a plan for, for good and not for harm. And so I, as I pour out my heart to God and thank God for who God is, then I make my supplication. I believe if you'll follow this pattern of prayer, if you follow this pattern of meditation, you'll find that you really do have the peace that truly passes all understanding. Paul has this. We can see it from his letter to the Philippians. If you turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, he says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What an amazing response to being imprisoned. 
I mean, if I was Paul, I'd be like, man, this is horrible. The food's horrible. Why am I in prison? Lord, I'm serving you. Why have you allowed me to get into prison, right? Not Paul. Because he practices what he preaches and meditating on what is good and what is right, and he rejoices in the Lord always by offering prayers with thanksgiving, he can see how God is able to work all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. How even his imprisonment is helping spread the gospel. The next time we become depressed, we should do what Paul exhorts us to do in Philippians chapter 4. We need to rejoice in the Lord We need to offer prayers of thanksgiving and adoration and confession. And then we make our supplications as we meditate on all that God has already done for us. Sadly, in our story in Numbers, the riffraff, the rabble, the vagabonds are not thinking about what God has already done for them. They're not meditating on the fact that God has already delivered them from the evil hand of Pharaoh and defeated Pharaoh's army by parting the Red Sea for them. They're not thinking about the fact that God is providing food for them every day and that God has provided water for them along the journey, that God has a plan for them and it's a promised land that he's taking them to. They're not thinking about that. They're thinking about all I got is this manna to eat and I wish I had some eat. Show me the meat. That's like that old Wendy's commercial. Where's the meat? Show me the meat. I want some meat to eat. And this isn't the first time the rabble or the riffraff have complained. Now in Exodus chapter 15, you may remember the They come to some water that's bitter, and so they they grumble to Moses about the bitter water. Then in the very next chapter, in Exodus chapter 16, they begin to grumble to Moses because they don't have enough food to eat. And then in Exodus chapter 17, they grumble because they don't have enough water to drink. And and whenever the riffraff and the rabble and the Israelites have frustration, they go to Moses and they grumble and they complain. And in our text this morning, we read that they're even crying outside his tent, and Moses He's had enough. Listen again to Moses' response to the people's complaining. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone, and the burden is too heavy for me. If you'll treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. Moses is so depressed, he wishes he was dead. Thankfully, God doesn't answer Moses' prayer for death. Thankfully, Moses doesn't take his own life. Have you ever been so depressed you just wish it was over? Well, we should do what Moses does. Notice what Moses does. He doesn't go to the people with his complaint. He goes to the Lord first. When we find ourselves becoming depressed, we need to turn to the Lord and offer that prayer, that adoration, that confession, that thanksgiving with supplication to God. With thanksgiving, we make our supplications to God It's the first feelings of depression and anxiety and worry and concern. We need to go to God first. But notice how God helps deliver Moses from his depression. We read about in verse 16 and 17 of our text. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you have known to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that's on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it yourself alone. God lets Moses know, you're not alone. I will put my spirit on others to help you carry this burden. Did you notice that last verse in our text that I read in Numbers 11, verse 29? Joshua becomes concerned because there's two men who have the Spirit of God, and yet they're not with Moses at the tent of meeting. He's like, hey, we need to stop those guys from prophesying. And Moses, rather than becoming jealous, he celebrates that these people have the Spirit. And he says this, But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, the Lord would put his Spirit on them. My brothers and sisters, the good news of the gospel is that that has happened. 
If you go to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and chapter 2, you'll read the story of how the resurrected Jesus promises His Holy Spirit to all of His disciples. In Acts 1, verse 8, He tells them that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will come upon them, and he will be, they will be His witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then at the end of Acts chapter 1, they spend time, many days in prayer, praying for the Holy Spirit to come. And then in Acts 2, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon each one of them, filling them with the spirit of truth, the spirit of, of goodness. And they are able to speak prophetically and proclaim the good news of God's love, that God is with us and God will not abandon us. And God has empowered us to do the work of his kingdom, that we can be with God forever if we will simply put our faith in Christ. Yes, the next time we're depressed, we need to turn to God first. We need to carry our burdens to God by adoring him, confessing our sins, thanking him for his continual provision, and then making our supplications to God. Doing that breath prayer we talked about, that centering prayer as we begin our prayer time. But know that we're not alone, that the Holy Spirit is in each one of us who believes that Jesus is Lord. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 18 that when two or more gather together in his name, he promises to be there. And whatever we agree upon together, he will do. And so we need to take that burden to God, and then we need to take that to other brothers and sisters in Christ to share our concerns so they might pray for us and join us in prayer and intercede for us that we might find strength in the body of Christ together. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the head cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. We are all members of the body of Christ. And we're not called to stand alone. We're called to be together, connected by one spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us and to help us in our time of need. You know, if you're not a part of a small group this year, this is a great time to begin that. As I know many people have New Year's resolutions. If you're not a part of a Sunday school, we literally have a Sunday school pretty much for every demographic within our church body. We've got men's Bible studies that meet during the lunch hour pretty much every day of the week. We've got women's Bible studies meeting almost every day of the week. You know, I would encourage you to reach out to Murray Gossett if you'd like to be in a men's Bible study or to reach out to Emily Wood, our women's director, to be a part of a, a women's Bible study. But if you're wrestling with depression, if you're going through a dark season of life, we actually have a, have a group. It's called uh, uh, Talk pray, no. You talk, you pray, and you know. And Denise and Dan Carter help lead that group at Murray's house. If you'd like to be a part of that, again, talk to Murray or Emily, and they can connect you to that group. A group where people gather together, they cry out to the Lord, they pray, they share their concerns, and they help one another carry the burdens. As we can see from our text in Numbers 11, that God wants Moses to know, you're not alone, and neither are we. We have places we can go First to the Lord, and then to each other. And if you're wrestling with really dark depression, perhaps you have clinical depression. I have some family members who take medication because of an imbalance, chemical imbalance in their brain, and they've got to have that in order to, to stay stable. We have a great counseling center here in Amarillo. It's called the Amarillo Family Institute. Amarillo Family Institute. In fact, our own Elizabeth Smith is a, a deacon and a counselor there. A lot of great Christian counselors who can help you talk through the pain and the darkness and get you the help you need. Because my brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ, and we're not called to carry the burdens of this world alone. We're called to give them to God and to intercede with each other to help us carry these burdens, knowing that we have a God who has already conquered sin and death on our behalf, and nothing can separate us from His love. And it's that love that gives us hope each and every day. Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, as we look at this story of Moses in the wilderness and the grumbling, complaining rabble and how their negativity led the Israelites to complain as well. Lord, we want to be the kind of people who follow the direction of the Apostle Paul, who keep their minds focused by meditating on what is right and what is good and turning to you in anxious times, asking you for help first and foremost and then sharing our concerns with other brothers and sisters in Christ that we might intercede with each other, recognizing that the Holy Spirit is within each one of us who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And we are the body of Christ. We're not called to carry these burdens alone, but you have given us each other that we might help each other in our time of need. And by your Holy Spirit, your presence is made known to us as we bring our concerns to you. So Lord, I pray that anyone who's wrestling with depression, when we go through dark times, dark nights of the soul, that we wouldn't try to do it alone. That we'd come to you and we'd come to others, spirit-filled people sharing our concerns so we might experience 
your healing presence. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son, who is the Christ, and all God's people said, amen.